I was a setter when I was in the back row, and I was a hitter when I was in the front row. So we ran what was what we call 6-2. And I was being recruited as a setter. Now, USC, uh, my family, we didn't have a lot of money. Obviously, when my dad is, you know, picking up the whole family of six and starting new things and being a full-time student, you know, it's not like we, I had the choice to go anywhere. I actually couldn't afford any Southern California state school because of the out-of-state um, <coughs> tuition. And so private school was sort of where, where I needed to be. And so this was just kind of a dream come true because all I was looking for was Southern California Division I. I, got, I wanted to be back near the beach and that's where volleyball's happening and that's where I want to be. And so I was being recruited. They come to my house, they meet my dad, and it ends up where they're, they offer me a scholarship. And everything was great until it wasn't. And he called, the coach called my dad and said, you know what, there's this foreign player who's taking the SATs as we speak, and I want to see if he passes this. And if he does, uh, we're taking a heavy look at him. And that was pretty devastating. And just like that, uh, that opportunity seemed to vanish. And it was tough because it was really late in the school year, and the other teams had already been making their decisions and choices. And so that that player that he ended up getting actually turned out to be a longtime teammate of mine, Donald Sujo, which is kind of a funny story, John. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, <coughs> he was the foreign center that ended up getting citizenship and played actually on our national team in uh, 2012. So there I am, a little bit devastated, USC reneging. Now like, what? is going to happen. And uh, this is kind of fascinating to me, and this has happened lots of times when unknown situations occur. I'll get this thing in my head, some random idea or request. And so I had, I had two things, and, and this third random thing was added to it. So Division One, Southern California, and the campus had to be green. And I don't know if that was because I was living in Brown, Phoenix, Arizona. But I just wanted it to be green, which was totally bizarre. But again, like I said, that kind of uh, premonition has happened before. And so we get, my dad gets a call from Rick McLaughlin, who's the coach of Loyola Marymount. And he says, we want to invite you guys to come check out our campus. And so we come, and again, those are my three things. OK, Loyola Marymount, it's in Southern California. It's Division I. And I step on campus and I see the trees, I see the sunken gardens, I see the bluff, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, it's green, I'm in. <laughs> so I commit and I come here. And what's hilarious is that I'm here for like two weeks and Rick says, I know you were recruited as a setter, but we already have two really good setters, so you're gonna be a hitter. And um, I had, that, that was the moment that I started passing. And passing is a very, technical skill, and for those of you who don't play volleyball, passing is one of the most important skills in volleyball because it sets up the entire offense. Uh, the better you can pass, the higher probability of success you will have over, over time. And so those first couple years of learning that skill were incredibly tough. But I think Rick knew what he was doing. Here at Loyola, I met lifelong friends. I had an amazing experience. Um, I was a part of a campus ministry that was run totally by students. That was amazing. Uh, I was a communications major. I wanted to do TV, as we were discussing earlier, but I couldn't afford it. And the labs were right during their, um, practice time. So I almost want to like come back. And the resources that you guys have here are amazing. And in fact, uh, I like to joke that the thing that I took from my degree more than anything was networking because uh, us volleyball players were very good at forming study groups with the smartest people in the class uh, because we were too focused on practice. But that was our thing. We were networking in that sense. Um, but I do regret not taking full advantage of all the resources that are here on campus. But it was a great athletic experience. It was a great lifestyle experience. And by the time that we reached uh, the playoffs, uh, you guys obviously we had a men's team at one time, and uh, we beat the nation number one team, Long Beach State, in the first round of playoffs and went on to finish sixth in the nation. So it was a very successful, super fun year. Uh, I, during that, 
final close before I graduated, I got calls from several agents overseas. And it was just like, hey, Reed, there's these opportunities abroad that, that you can come and play professionally. And I never gave it a single thought, not once. Uh, it was the furthest thing from my mind. I thought, why would I go to Europe and play when I, I'm, I'm back in Southern California? Like, this is where I want to be. And my only exposure to professional volleyball was the AVP Tour. That's what was really big through the 90s. It was on NBC every Sunday. And Karch Karai and Steve Tennant and, you know, The Hob, all this stuff. That was what was happening. And that was my vision of where I wanted to go. And so when I started, those ideas started to pop up, I completely disregarded them. I was dating my now wife, um, but there's a complicated story that I'm going to tell you. And uh, all, my vision for myself was graduate, play pro volleyball, marry the girl of my dreams, live in suburbia, Southern California, and raise a family. But when I graduated, I started feeling this outside pressure. You know, up to this point, it was okay for me to play a sport. But now, somehow the stakes were changing. So much so that I was on uh, a boat on the way back from Catalina, and my father-in-law, who was then my girlfriend's dad, was grilling me about professional volleyball. How much do you make? Like, where would you play? Who's going to pay you? And to the point where he started banging his fist on the table saying, how are you going to support my daughter? I was like, I don't know, you know, <laughs> up to this point, things, doors have opened, you know, things have really come together. And it's, it's, I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to go play volleyball and go to college and have it paid for and do all these things. I didn't plan that out, so I don't know how to plan the next phase out. But there was this outside pressure, and that summer, I needed flexibility, I needed space. And I wasn't feeling that space. And that eventually caused her and her family to think that I was unmotivated and going nowhere. And she ended up breaking up with me. And that was devastating, but that's not what this talk is about. <laughs> hey, I got the girl, by the way. So. But that summer, I spent half the summer touring. Uh, we, we had a place uh, in Hermosa Beach. There was three of us. I think I slept in like a nook of a dining room. Uh, we were just making it happen and uh, I toured around on the beach tour and eventually qualified and got into main draws. And whenever the national team, which was based in Colorado Springs, whenever they were training in Colorado, they were bringing me out. And so the opportunity existed a year before for me to redshirt my senior year and really try to make the 2000 Olympic team. But I passed on that because too much was happening here on campus. I wanted to graduate with my friends. I wanted to finish the degree. I don't know why, but I'm really glad because I have teammates that just went pro and have never finished the degree. But I was focused on this degree's happening in, in four years. Um, and so there was just too much taking place for me to say that. So I just thought, you know what, as soon as I graduate, I'll roll the dice and maybe I can sneak on the team later. So whenever they were in Colorado, I was there training. So I kind of got to see both worlds. And when I was in Colorado Springs, I got to see the Olympic Training Center and meet these guys that were my heroes and talk to them and they're playing overseas in different countries. And uh, it was just so great to have that exposure. But I still had no idea what I was going to do. And my girlfriend already dumped me because she saw that. <laughs> um, I can't tell you how important it was to have that space. And I was eventually named an alternate on that team. I didn't make the team. And I was there for that whole lead up to the Olympic Games. And that month before you take off to the Olympics, it's the most exciting time. I mean, the excitement is palpable. You, all this gear is coming in that has a flag on it and the rings. And there's all this energy in the, in the city that you're in becomes alive and they, they start to care of what you're doing. And for those of us that play fringe sports, it's special to start to feel, uh, you know, a bigger energy that's starting to develop and this momentum. And 
there's all of these, every day at practice, there's these special things that are taking place, and there's just so much excitement. I got to see all that. And I was even on the bus with the team going to Denver, seeing all that excitement, and being the 13th guy on the bus, and 12 of them are headed to Sydney, and I'm headed to Los Angeles. And that was really the first really major loss that I went through in my career where I felt like, man, that, I missed out. But it was so critical for me to see that excitement and to know that, man, this, this four-year commitment, even if it's here in Colorado Springs and it's not Southern California, maybe if my family's not here, friends aren't here, what I just saw, what those guys were going to go do, this is going to be worth it. And that really started to help me transition into thinking that like maybe indoor is a possibility. But there they are in Sydney playing. I'm watching on TV, kind of bitter about it. And the Olympics come and go. And then it's just like, well, shoot, what am I going to do? I have no idea what I'm going to do. So I start just trying to do this and do that. And really nothing was developing. And I started to feel like the loser that my girlfriend said I was. And uh, eventually, not long after, I get a phone call that says, hey, Reed, uh, this, is, this is my buddy George. He's, he's calling from Italy, and he's saying my, one of our teammates uh, blew out his shoulder. We need an outside hitter. They want this guy, but we're trying to pitch you. Get on a plane and get over here and try out for this team. So I say, okay. And I go, and I go to Forli, Italy. Fly into Bologna. It's about a, an hour drive. And I try out for three days, and they offer me a contract for 55,000 euro. Now, that might as, as well have been $5 million to me. Because remember, all I needed was $10,000 in a Ford Explorer. This gets me the Ford Explorer, and then I've got, you know, pocket change galore. And that's when the doors just opened up. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in Italy, the best league in the world, especially at that time. And I was just a kid amongst men. And I was on the worst team. It was, that part was awful. But just seeing this whole new experience open up was a huge, huge thing. And like I said, you know, I had $10,000 in a Ford Explorer on my mind. You know, I played 16 years, uh, 14 of which I played on pro teams abroad. And that number was matched a thousand times over, which you'd never think in indoor volleyball. It's a girls' sport, right? Especially in America, that's what we think. But volleyball is a big deal uh, around the world, and this completely opened up uh, a totally new avenue for me. And so I ended up playing in four Olympic games, as John said, and there was lots of good times, and there was a lot of bad times. And in 2014, I uh, landed awkwardly in Bulgaria. We were on a tacky floor. It was almost like they had a rave the night before and didn't clean up the beer or something. I mean, like it was like really tacky to the point where in practice we were diving and our shirts were like pulling down. And I just landed funny and twisted and I ended up tearing my ACL completely away from the bone and then having to fly the next day, which was brutal. But this was a devastating injury. I was 36 and a half. And everything up to this point had been amazing. I'd been pretty, I mean, there were some, there were some major injuries, but nothing more than like a six week. Okay, I had facial reconstructive surgery, but that was only six weeks and I was back. Um, one of my teammates elbowed me uh, while blocking. But other than that, you know, things were, were good. And I had to fight back and had to make the decision of how to repair this. And we talked about this with the girls last week, is I ended up deciding to use my own tissue because to use a cadaver, uh, I was told, was a one in five failure rate. To use your own tissue was one in 20. And being 36 and only have two years for Rio, I could not afford a fill. And so I chose to use my own tissue. The problem was that I tore the ACL in my right knee, and my right patella tendon was unusable as a graft because of all the jumping I've done. There's too many bone fragments, it's super thin. And so I had to take, I had to make the decision to take 
the tendon from my good knee and make it my bad knee. So I had double knee surgery, which is like a double whammy. And actually to this day, this is definitely the more sore knee, but it stayed intact and the story ended well. So these two years, it's kind of what um, were super formative years for me. And so much took place. There were some highs, but most importantly, there was a ton of lows. We, it took forever for my knee to feel better. Uh, we got pregnant uh, with our second child, and which was a joy, but my wife almost died giving birth to her. She had a hemorrhage. She was like a breath away. That was another miracle. But it just it was kept on these, these um, highs and, and like low lows. And we, we fought through it and finally get back with the team. And meanwhile, the team was doing well. The team had a new coach that, prefer, uh, that has a preference for um, new, innovative, and has no fear of giving young guys a chance, which is great. But here I am, the old toy. And I had to fight through a lot of humility and humbling moments and uh, times where I felt overlooked. But by 2016, I felt like my knees were intact, my body was back. It was mine again. I felt like I lent it out or it was gone for a while. And um, I was playing some of the best volleyball of my career. And I ended up making the team. And as we're going to Rio, I'm feeling invigorated. I have one thing on my mind, and that's winning a gold medal. And I'm a very, uh, I like to have fun, but I'm a very serious competitor. To me, that's what's fun, competing at the highest level where success and failure almost merge into the same thing, and you're at the very edges of your ability. That's what I, that's the adrenaline rush that I'm pursuing as I try to compete at the highest level. So I get to Rio amped ready to lead from the front. And what I mean by that is, you know, I think I got into Espresso Forces uh, right around London, 2012. I was, I was reading tons of Special Forces books and SEALs and all of that stuff. And um, those guys just totally fascinate me. But when I think of a seasoned veteran, I think of the guy who goes in the room first. But he recognizes the danger. And if there's a grenade, he's the guy that's gonna jump on that grenade. That's what I was prepared to do. It wasn't about getting all the sets or being a hero or anything like that, but I'd been here and done it. I'd done it three times and I'd done it successfully. And so when we went, in, went into Rio, even though I was asking the coach, what's my role, what's my role, what's my role, he could never really articulate it. I'm not sure he really knew. Just keep doing what you're doing, you're playing great. Well, if I'm playing great, why aren't I playing? And so I get to Rio and realize that my role is certainly not on the court. You know, I'm not going to be, I'm not his, uh, I'm, I'm not in the, in the starting six. And so I went through the process in the first week especially to identify, okay, I'm not going to play. That, how am I still going to lead now from the back? How do I impact this team? How do I make a difference if I don't touch the ball? How do I contribute? That's all we want to do, right, when we're on team sports. How do I contribute? And I identify four areas where I could contribute. And one was to stay engaged. It's hard when you're on the bench. Those of, you know, we're all athletes. Uh, you guys might not be ones that have spent any time on the bench, but it's hard sometimes to stay engaged. When you're in the moment, when you're competing, it's easy to stay focused. For me, you know, you're trying to win, but when you're kind of a little bit removed and you're watching somebody else compete, you know, your mind can, can go off in other places. And so that was number one. How do I stay engaged? Number two was how do I stay warm? I'm 30, what was I, 38 uh, and a half in Rio. I wanted to make sure that if the coach pulled out a number eight, that I was already sweating and could put a ball away that instant. And for, for you guys, that might seem like an easy thing to do. For a 39-year-old, to be ready at a moment's notice is a little bit tougher. And so I worked super hard staying warm. I had this whole band workout and I just developed this entire workout to where when the game was over, I was tired. 
and we actually modified my weight training program to just be power lifts because I was taking care of everything else on the bench. And the other thing was, how do I contribute? How do I find ways to contribute if I don't touch the ball? And I feel like as the matches progressed, I was able to do each of these things. And we start off 0-2. How many of you guys watched the Olympics? Anybody see the volleyball stuff? So, so, so we started off 0-2, which is a terrible hole to dig yourself out of. And then we eventually beat Brazil at 10 p.m. at night was the match. And if you guys didn't know this, uh, soccer is the biggest sport in Brazil by far. Volleyball is actually pretty close too. It's a huge sport for them. Every time we go down there, we pack out, or they pack out, I should say, you know, 15, 20,000 seat arenas. There'll be a jumbotron outside where they'll have barbecues watching. Um, it's crazy. It's a crazy sport. They're crazy for volleyball. So we were able to to upset them in their home, and they went on to win the goal. Uh, and then we we beat France, which is one of the most electric teams out there. Uh, and then we go on and in the quarterfinals beat Poland, and then we are facing Italy in the semifinals. And, and against Italy, I felt like on all my things, that my role, I was connected as a gauge, I was ready at a moment's notice. And when that final ball dropped, and knowing that we lost and we weren't gonna have, I wasn't gonna personally have a chance to win or have the opportunity to compete for a gold medal, it was super devastating because I knew that this was it for me for indoor volleyball. There might be beach volleyball down the road and maybe I can try to compete there, but for indoor volleyball, this was it. And so I was dealing with a lot of bitterness and I was reaching out to my family. We had 24 hours to recover. We play every other day and our next match was gonna be at nine in the morning. And so that off day, I was really struggling. I just didn't understand how was the kitchen sink not on that court. How do we not throw everything at that match? And the last thing I wanted to do was leave my final match when I had made it this far with not a single word, negative word, accepting my role, working through all the struggle, the humility, the tough moments, the stress of my body not you know, coming back as fast as I wanted to. The last thing I wanted to do was for the final 24 hours to be you know, hindered by negativity. And so that night as I was contemplating everything and just thinking, was this two years worth it? I mean, gosh, my whole family, we put in so much to make this comeback and I haven't even really played and now gold medal's off the table and I'm probably not gonna play tomorrow. Like, was it worth it? Did I just waste two years? And it was in that moment that I just knew that the relationships and the experiences were the things that I'm, I'm taking with me, and those were valuable. I have new relationships with these teammates that are gonna last a lifetime. And we've had all these amazing experiences, and the two years were so formative for, for my wife and I especially, and all the struggle. And I just had gratitude, and I just knew that this was a total success. Though I didn't play, and hadn't played up to that point, that this was all totally worth it. So the next morning I woke up and we had a 9 a.m. Ma 9 a.m. match, which is super early. And uh, I just remember going through the, wor the warm up. We were in the warm up court, we walk into the main court and the match is starting. And I just remember being in the box and I was sweaty, I was warm. And I just stopped for a minute and I, I could tell that I was more in the moment at that moment than I ever was in my entire career. And to me, that's what being clutch is, is being able to be present in the moment. You're not thinking about the past, and you're not worried about the future. It's right here, right now. And I had this confidence that no matter what takes place today, whether we win or lose, whether I play or don't play, no matter what happens, I have what it takes to endure it. I knew that I had the same jersey on, but I was a different person. I wasn't the same number eight. I wasn't the same individual. And it was because of all this hardship. And not long into the match, the coach 
called my number. And there I was in the game. And we were down, we got down 0-2, and um, I, I just remember being able to embrace the moment. And when you're in that place, you're not thinking about when you're losing, you think about fighting for every point. And you don't want it to end. There's definitely been moments in my career where I just want to get this win over with. Can we just hurry up and win and be done? But when you're in the right spot, and you're what I think is a true clutch player, somebody who can really deliver no matter what the situation is, it's the people who can hyper-focus and concentrate under any situation, whether the pressure be really big or whether it be not at all. And so we were down 0-2, and I remember saying to my teammates, how long can we extend this match? How long can we stay on this court? Because the longer we can stay here, that means we're getting back into the game. And thankfully, we were stayed long enough to be able to beat the Russians 3-2 in a fifth set and won the bronze medal, which is cruising around. And so when it was all over, in this transition period that I'm in now, how do I tie this together, right? When it's all over, I have had the opportunity to speak in moments like these and to look back and reflect. And I was actually, I actually journaled the last 20 years. It was never something I had to do. It was never stuff like, oh, today I went and had pizza and it was really tasty and you know all this stuff. But when things would come to mind or I was really struggling with something, I would write stuff down because it would slow me down. My mind could go really fast. It would just slow me down. And so I just kind of broke all of them out. And it, it actually, it's probably helpful to tell you the volleyball, professional volleyball indoor calendar is incredibly demanding. There is zero off season. And so May through August is the national team season. So we all come in May, and the next thing you know, we're on the road playing as Team USA against other national teams. And then as soon as we're done with that season, within 72 hours, we are all relocated in different pro leagues around the world. I played in Italy for three years, Turkey for one, Russia for five, um, Austria, Korea, Greece for a couple years. And so you kind of just go and set up shop for eight months. They give you an apartment, a car, a salary, bonuses, and you're playing matches as if you're on the Lakers. You know, it's some foreign person coming here to the Lakers. We're doing the opposite. We're going there. And there's been times where I feel like I'm losing my memory because my wife or my friends would be like, remember that time when we went and did this and that and the other? And I'd be like, no. I have no idea what you're talking about. And they would be like, what are you, you were there. Like, that's ridiculous. But it was because it was just forward, 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 forward motion. In this last six months, I've been able to really start to look into these journals and see these themes. And, and as I've tried to develop material to host a camp or to when somebody asks me to speak, and I start to look back, I see these major themes start to develop. And it's very, it was very easy to write that book. And if you haven't read it, you can go to my website. It's free. It's just called Max Potential Playbook, readpretty.com. Uh, it's just a free PDF and this kind of came out of that reflection period and what I really found was that yes there's been great wins and medals and amazing experiences and great relationships and all these things but how would I really define my career if I look back on these 24 years of volleyball how would I define it and it was very simple I would define it by all of my losses because it was in those major losses, not making the team. The, the loss in 2004, when we made it to the medal rounds and got completely slammed, 3 0 3 0 Olympics over. Um, in 2010, not winning the world championships. That's the only thing I wanted, I was, I was pouring everything into that. All these major failures were the moments where catalytic change took place. And that was where I be began to see as I looked back that, man, volleyball was a passion and it kind of merged with my obsessive gene and then became like this pursuit of mastery. But really it was this vehicle towards character development. Like that's what, it, what sport is, I think. And, it, and that's the opportunity that we have. And when we start to take personal responsibility for our own growth and for dealing with loss and, and handling those situations, we begin to grow as people. And to me, that's what 
success is. It's not in the wins and losses and the earnings. It's in who we are as people. And, you know, even though I have my medals with me today, it's the character that was forged through all of this experience that really helps me be a better husband or a better father or a better friend or a better business person. Um, it was that. It's not the medals. You don't carry around your medals and just be like, hey, you know, like, get me in the club. Like, here's my medal. <laughs> And so that's, that's really what I wanted to share with you guys today. And if there's one thing I think our world needs is more leaders. Do you guys agree? Our world is desperate for more leaders. And to me, leadership starts with service. I think that the people when I look to, the great leaders, they've figured out that life isn't about them. And they're committed to seeing other people succeed. And I feel like when when we commit ourselves to be better leaders and we start with the idea of service, then we start to connect with something that's larger than ourselves. And that's when we find true joy and fulfillment. I think we can become, have this perspective through competing on teams, which, are, which we're doing now. For me, it came when I got married. Um, all of a sudden, it's not you anymore. You know, you got this team, and then, of course, having kids. Now it's like, gosh, I have this responsibility. But that maturity. And so when people say, how, do, how, how would you tell a younger group how to make that transition happen faster? I really don't know what the answer is, but I just know it happens when you start to realize that life isn't about you. That there's, there's bigger things in motion. And that, for me, when I look back on my career and the other teammates I've had, the things that you miss the most is the shared experiences that you've had with your teammates. You know, those things of grinding day in and day out. It's not the individual stuff, it's the stuff that you've done as a group. So if there's four things I wanna leave you with, it's number one, you're not alone. As you're transitioning, I fundamentally believe that, you're not alone. Number two, life isn't about you. Three, embrace failure and learn to adapt. There were so many more talented people who came into the gym and I believe that my ability to stay in the national team gym as long as I did and on the professional world was my ability to learn and adapt. And that really, I break it more down in the book, but it really comes from being able to look at yourself honestly and deal with your weaknesses. If you can identify your weaknesses, then you can formulate a plan and make them a strength. It's really simple, but when we put up our self-defense defense mechanisms and try to deflect and it's not me, it's, it's them, it's that person, it's that coach, whatever, then we just totally stunt our own personal growth. And the last thing is there's joy and fulfillment in serving. So I wish you all the best in your future transition and all your future failures. And I mean that sincerely. I, I really believe that. I think a lot of people in these moments say you're going to be great and successful and I think you will but know that it's gonna come through failure and don't hide from it, embrace it, and let it do its work because that's where the good stuff happens. So thanks. What do you see yourself doing like now at your job? Great question. Um, I, so uh, I've got two things going. Uh, I believe volleyball is underdeveloped. And I've always, like I said, I, I wanted to do TV and media production here. And so I would like to start a sports media and production company that starts with, with volleyball. It's a totally underexposed uh, market. Nobody's doing it. And um, there's so many athletes, professional athletes, that want to continue to play professionally. And I think volleyball has a, uh, a fan base out there but we have to give them the ability to be fans. And to me, that means we've got to tell more complete stories. And so instead of waiting for somebody else to tell complete stories, I think I, that's what I'd like to take on. So how you said it uh, in Rio, where you're third place? Yeah. And you said you felt like you were in that moment. Mm -hmm. You had that mental state. How do you do that when it's not a match with that much pressure, or a game with that much pressure, like day in and day out? Yeah. Like Sure. How do you like consistent? Yeah. Yeah. So focus is a skill. 
And, um, you know, guys uh, wearing suits on TV like to talk about clutch and focus as being something that some people have and others don't. I think it's total BS. Um, it's a skill, and with, like any skill, you have to practice it. And so we would actually do things to practice concentrating. And uh, after every practice, we would do different exercises, um, one of which was to try to concentrate on our breathing. So our coach would say, okay, we're going to give it two minutes right now. You know, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Now go, two minutes. And we would focus on one part of our breath, whether it was the air going through our nose or the air coming out of our mouth. There was some point that we wanted to direct our mind to. And what would happen is, is you'd hear a ball bouncing somewhere else or somebody talking in the corner. And the tendency is to be like, oh, man, I totally messed up because I heard that ball bouncing. But what our mental coaches would say is just acknowledge it and then get right back to it. Like, it, you don't need to, like, get worked up by, like, oh, I acknowledge it. No, it's there. The ball's bouncing. Fine. Leave it. Now I'm back to my breath. Boom. I'm focused. And that's really, you know, the more that you can speed up that loop, it's really helpful. The second thing I would say is I really made a jump in that sense actually when there was no pressure. So I was actually playing in Anaheim in um, the Civic Center, I believe it was, right by Disneyland. We were playing a North Seca tournament. We were probably playing, like, Puerto Rico in a 10,000-seat arena that, like, 10 people were at, or 100 people, but it felt like 10. And I just remember being really insecure of, like, am I being too loud? Like, am I, you know? And I, I remember at that moment saying, you know what? This is my domain. This is my space. This is where I do what I do, and I love what I do. And so I don't care how it looks. And I think, like, putting up those barriers of, like, this is, for volleyball, I would say, it's 900 square feet. Like, that's my space. And before every game, I would just commit myself. The next three hours, I'm going to give it all that I have. I'm not going to worry about what I'm doing later tonight or, you know, whatever, whatever. And so I think those are some of the exercises where you can start to say, you know, concentration is a skill. And don't beat yourself up if you're in a game and your mind kind of wanders. Just acknowledge it. Boom. Now I'm right back. What am I doing? These are the three things that I've wanted to do this game, and I'm right back on it. Great question. Um, so my wife and I were married in 2007, the girlfriend that dumped me. Um, <laughs> so apparently I, I wasn't as rudderless as she thought. But um, we tried, I think it was in 2007, it was when, uh, I mean, we got married and three days later we were on a 10-week contract in Greece. And then, I mean, it just started. And we did a few th times where we were separate, and it just wasn't good for us. And so we just made it a value that you know, whatever contract I'm signing, like even in Russia, we actually got to fly around in jets and cool stuff like that. But I had in the contract that she was with me all the time. Um, it became a little bit more difficult when we started having um, kids. But still, they were always coming with me. And uh, we made that a high priority, even in Rio. I mean. Rio turned out to be a huge expense, but it was like, man, we just went through this gnarly ordeal. There's no way the family's not going to be there. This, we're in this together. And that was just a huge value for us. Uh, there's been a lot of families that have done the separate thing. And if you ask my opinion, I think it, it's really difficult. It's really hard. But we just made it a value that said, you know, we're not going to accept anything that's not going to accept all of us. And in fact, um, I was playing for this team that is our version of the Yankees. I played for them for two years, and I had an unbelievable relationship with the coach. Um, and it was awesome playing for that team, but the, the relationship dissolved when my wife needed to get uh, a procedure. I missed a lift, and next thing you know, I'm in a meeting with him, and he's screaming at me saying, we signed a contract with you, not with you and your family. And I was just like, well, that's where we're going to have to part ways because so we finished the season, but I didn't play for that team anymore. But uh, you have to make those value-based judgments along the way. But that's how we managed it. It's, it's not easy. There's a lot of travel. And my wife had to carry a huge load with little babies uh, You know, when I was on tournaments. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks for having me.